churches, Seventh-day Adventist churches up and down the country. And it's really good. One of our, um, it's good to talk about what we do. I, I enjoy, I get, I get involved with what we do. Um, and it's really good to talk to the church members and sort of tell them what's going on in the, in the big world of ADRA. And also, um, part of our focus is, part of, you know, the things that I like, is that I like to see churches involved in the community. And we've got opportunities to do that, to get involved in the, in the community. And we're doing it in all sorts of ways, little, little ADRA projects that we have going on. But first of all, I've got to earn my wages. I've got to talk about ADRA. And I'm just going to give a little bit of a brief uh, rundown on what happens because surprisingly enough, no matter how many churches I go to and where I end up, there's a lot of people that don't understand what ADRA does. They don't understand... Uh, what development is and things like that. So we're just going to go on about, here we've got um, Ad, ADRA is worldwide active in 128 countries. Um, and also because we've got all of these countries have different needs, you know, like we've got implementing a donor office. Uh, ADRA New Zealand is basically a donor office. So these are countries, the difference between a donor office and an implementing office is that you can imagine that an ADRA um, organization in India and in Pakistan, Bangladesh, Vietnam, Cambodia, you know, need I go on? These are the places that have the real need. We've got, we are so fortunate to live in this country here. You know, we get to, our government, we've got a stable government, we've got an economy, we've got a police force, a civil defense, and things like that. So these are the things that we are blessed with. And we become a donor office, just as Australia, um, England, uh, ADRA America, um, ADRA Denmark, all of these countries, they contribute money, which is distributed through what they call non-governmental organisations, NGOs like ADRA, like um, World Vision and places like that. So we end up managing the money that our governments give for development in other countries, where we do the cow banks and the wells and the water and sanitation and stuff like that. So there's an awful lot of work to be done out there. Now, our office also is... Um, is divided into three sections. So ADRA New Zealand, we have our emergency section, which you see, that's the high profile one. You have a tsunami, an earthquake, a flood, or something like that, it's the high profile bit. It's the stuff that really we can see. It's a visible thing. Now, what, what we also have is we have our international, I've mentioned the, the cow banks and the, the wells and the, the sanitation things and stuff going on. So there's an awful lot of work to do there. Now, what I'm involved with, I'm more involved with the national side of it. Now, charity does begin at home because we've got all of these needs overseas. We have so many needs here in New Zealand. We have so many needs within your community around this church. And these are the things that our national program deal with. Now, what I'm going to do is also I've asked our deacons, I've got some uh, supporter forms. I'm going to ask, there's a form that I'm going to ask them to hand out, um, and it just it says simple things. Now, you may have seen these before. You may have filled one out before. You may never have seen these. And they ask little things like, I would like to commit to regularly praying for the work of ADRA. If ever an organization needed some prayers, it's ADRA. Because we get into all sorts of situations. So, um, you know, where you imagine you're dealing with outbreaks of cholera. You're dealing with, you know, in situations that you are very much at risk. Can you imagine if you're dealing and standing in front of 50, 60,000 people and they are starving and you're distributing food and you're standing there? I mean, you're at risk, medicines and stuff like that. So I'm going to ask if people could just show of hands, if anybody would like to support us with prayer, that would be really good. I would love these to go out because I would like to also hand out some of these here. I would love to make things like our reports. We have all the all the pictures of what we do, the, the stuff we do, we produce really good documents. Now, we can't share it with you guys if we don't know who you are or where you are. Anybody who has an email address, I can email these documents to you. So just put your hands up if you'd like one of these because I'm going to connect to these later on. But even if you've become a supporter of ADRA, I would still like to know that you may support through your church, but that doesn't automatically connect you to our office. So we would like to know that, we would like to acknowledge the things that you do. We can't do it if we don't know who you are. So it would be really lovely to um, fill those out and just 
fold them in half and give them to me or give them to Barbara afterwards. I've even got some if you don't get any during the service. But I'm just going to talk about how, to, how does this church become connected into its community. Now, there's some really good little programs that we have. I've no doubt that the Wangarei Church does an emergency food program. Okay, so if somebody needs food, or maybe, in fact, I know you do it, I know you do welfare work, because I've got a van out there, and it is chock-a-block full of clothing and stuff to go into your uh, welfare department. So, <laughs> there's another call for volunteers. After the church, a few of the young, strong people could come out and help carry some bags out of that van and put it into where you store it would be really well received. What happens, ADRA doesn't actually do welfare. And this is something that is really hard for churches to get their head around, hard for people to get their head around because we haven't explained it well enough in a lot of cases. Let's take, for instance, we've got a little food program going here or somebody needs some food and you give them a pack of food and the next week they might come by and they'll say, look, you know, thank you very much for the food but we still haven't got money for food, can you help us this week? Well, you might help them that week, but when they come to the third week with the same story, the penny has to drop. Something's going on. Why has that family got no money for food? Now, it may be all sorts of things. Now, we've established a little food program where instead of just handing out the food like Santa Claus, we're actually giving out a set amount of food in a bag with a little card in there that says, this is from the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and through our partners at Sanitarium Health Food or whatever, we're giving away this food. And also we do little programs, budgeting, addictions, uh, parenting, and that sort of stuff. Now, can you start to see that what happens is development, like giving away the food is welfare. If people need anything, you give them food, you give them clothes, you give them shoes. If their house burns down, you give them blankets or whatever they need. Giving them the goods is welfare. But if you've got somebody who's short of food, like me, I, I'm always going through money. You know, It just goes through my fingers. I'm not a good budgeter. And I could have a little budgeting class within this church and do a budgeting seminar or something like that. That seminar is development. So teaching them to do something to stop them having that problem, that's the development side. Now, that's what ADRA does. We can't do good development without the churches doing good welfare because the welfare leads on to development. So there's all sorts of things. You know, there's, churches are doing some lovely stuff. There's uh, a couple of girls in uh, Hamilton Church have just started up a clothing library for newborn babies. So they come along with these little baby packs. Women are having these kids, families are having these kids and they can't afford it. So these girls arrive with a baby pack, a welcome baby pack, and they say, here you go, in there is a, a, the range of clothing. So they go from newborn, zero, zero, zero. It's all sort of foreign to us blokes, but the women will understand all of these little sizes. And the kids grow so quick. So they give them these clothing, this clothing pack and then a few weeks later, they'll show up and they'll take that clothing pack back and they'll give them the next bigger size. Now, they've got this connection. Here they are establishing a connection with this new mother, new family, new baby, all that sort of stuff. It's that connection between the church people and the, and the people in the community. So there's all sorts of little ways that we can get into that. And it's really good to do that sort of thing. Um, with our emergency section, which again, as I mentioned, is our high profile thing, you know, you see, who would have thought, like the closest that Adra New Zealand came to ever being an implementing country was with the Samoan tsunami, where we had people on the ground within, within 24 hours. On the ground, into, into Samoa, on the ground to do assessments to see what's needed. Because for the first two or three days of any disaster, what happens in reality is you look after your own family. Then you've got to actually get the right equipment into the right place to do the right thing. So it's tarpaulins and water and stuff like that. The sort of thing that you do see on TV and you know everybody knows what's needed, but to do the assessments, to get in and do those emergency assessments is great. Who would have thought that Australia would have had, you know, they've been the recipients of ADRA money. We all collected money for the Aussie bushfires. There's been so many things going on. Haiti, you can look at the back of your lesson pamphlet and see the countries that we are helping in this quarter with the lesson pamphlet, 
and you can look at all of them. It's all Denmark, it's Austria, it's places in Europe, things like that. And if you look at the total, you'll find that there's, uh, I don't know, the, there may be 100,000 people or something like that. But if you look at just a place like Haiti, which has only got 8 million people, over 300,000 Adventists in Haiti. You know, we're doing great stuff in Haiti. ADRA International, which is another name for ADRA America, is doing a lot of work in Haiti. Our university in Haiti has now become a, a refugee camp for 25,000 people on the lawns, on the grounds of the university. So we're doing an awful lot of stuff in places like that. What happens if something hits New Zealand? Are we ready? Is this community ready if a disaster happens here? Through ADRA, we're starting up a new program where we're working in we're taking, uh, we're, we're doing training, and we take, we're asking for volunteers. Maybe you've got skills in the medical trade, or maybe you've got skills in transportation. Maybe you've got skills in some sort of logistics or organisation that would be really good for civil defence. Wouldn't it be nice if this church was known as a civil defence headquarters for the area, like Tauranga churches and places like that? So we're, we're starting up this program, and I want you to keep your eyes open because through our um, supporter, for, our supporter scheme, we're going to be telling you we're going to be asking for people to come in and do some training. We're going to we'll teach you how to use the radios and stuff like that. So we're starting to get this network of people that can respond, emergency responders through the ADRA organisation. We're going to do that. Every city in this country has an emergency management section. Wangarei is no different. You'll have an emergency manager who will have a team of people that do simulations and practices for different disasters that may happen. And I'm going to tell you about, um, we made an offer to several large emergency management uh, sections of different cities and regions around the country, and we said, look, we've got so many disasters going on, because the last two years have been an absolute nightmare. We've got so many things going on, we actually offered some space or places for people that we would send them as volunteers if the city would pay for their person, their key person, to go and work on one of our projects, would they be interested? Well, we got flooded. It was really good. We ended up sending a guy from Taranaki over to Sri Lanka, where they had the um, huge refugee camps that, again, just happened to be one of the camps happened to be at a place called Vivunia, which was where the Seventh-day Adventists had quite a stronghold. We had a school, we had a church, we had a pastor there, we had a, a school teacher, and she was uh, very on the grounds. And right next to the school was this refugee camp. Over 180,000 people in this refugee camp. And she offered the use of the school, maybe we can uh, have it as a platform, as a base to work from to deal with the refugees. We sent this guy from Taranaki over there, and he stayed there for a month, and he worked with the um, ADRA people in Sri Lanka, and when he came back, he brought back these images and pictures, and he said that nothing that he could have done in a simulation would have prepared him for what he saw and what he did. He was doing stuff day by day that made the difference between life and death in a lot of people. So we thought, well, okay, I've, I looked at the pictures and I thought I can put a little program together because what I'm going to do is I'm going to, the program here, we're going to take you to Sri Lanka and we're going to look at one of these camps. And we're going to look at how things operate and we're going to then turn that into a bit of a Bible study, which is another um, pet subject of mine, something that I'm interested in. So we'll start off actually with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we... We want you to make the presence of the Holy Spirit felt in this building right now. Lord, we want to learn about other people and their misfortunes. We want to learn about how we can help, how we can assist. We also want to learn about your Bible. We want to understand more about that. We ask that all of this happens today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we're going to go to this refugee camp in Vivunia. And you've got to ask yourself, why do they have refugee camps? Um, I guess there's an, I hope we can see all that. You ask yourself, why do they have refugee camps? Well, here we've got this country where this is probably one of the longest running wars. It's been going for about 25 years. And you end up with a refugee camp is that the government herded the people that were opposing them together into a small area, and then they bombed them with everything they had. They hit them hard. In the end, it was a surrender situation. 
So you end up with this refugee camp, and, and of course, you've got to work out who's a winner and who's a loser in these situations. The winner is obviously the guy with the gun, uh, the loser is the guy with the red with the white flag. So these people, and we're talking lots of people, 180,000 people in one camp that we've been associated with. There are four camps. Some of them are bigger, some of them a little bit smaller. Into these camps you end up with, you end up with the wire, you end up with the guns. Uh, not a friendly situation, okay? Now a lot goes on there. Adris Sri Lanka was involved with what they call non-food items. So these were the, the sanitation issues, the, just the soap, the water and stuff like that. Adris Sri Lanka specializes in treating water and providing water. Who's mostly affected in some of these things? It's the old people, it's the young people, it's the sick people, it's the people that can't look after themselves. These are the people that we're helping. Okay, and this is, you know, unbelievably serious situations. In the middle of that picture, that little black round thing there, that's a landmine. There are millions of these things all over the place. The worry is nobody knows where they are. So you end up with, if you were sitting on that and it blew up, it would probably kill you. They're not that powerful, they are nasty pieces of gear. If you were running or walking across a field and you walked or stepped over one of them, it would take your leg off or your foot off or your arm off or your eye out or something like that. So there's an awful lot of situations where there are people that are maimed by these things. When you look at the camps, this is one photo that he took of one section of one camp. And what he said to me was that what you can't understand is the flimsiness, you can't see it from the photos, the flimsiness of these structures. And this is where people live. These are the most affected people in any of these war situations, and that's the children. Now, there are three things most trafficked in the world. You can understand guns and you can understand drugs. The third thing most trafficked in the world is children. Children are stolen, they are sold, they are sold for immoral purposes, they are sold mostly for slaves, and they are sold for s soldiers. Now, the Tamils specialize in child soldiers. An armed, well-trained child is one of the most deadly fighting units that you can get. So when the government of Sri Lanka gets these, peop these people into a concentration camp, into a, an IDP camp, which is the internally displaced person camp, they're not gonna trust these kids one minute because it wasn't long ago they were fighting against them. The kids are under threat. These are some of the tense situations of, you know, cooking, you, you've got to do everything in there. Here is a typical five-man tent. There are so many people in these tents, they stay together for security because when you're in one of these camps, you're not even safe from people in the camps will kidnap you or your family. They want food, they want medicines, they want money. They will kidnap you and ransom you back to your family. You're lucky if you get a tent in some cases as well. Now here's our Adra Sri Lanka country director, a Mexican hardworking guy. Like I said, Adra specializes in water. And he's looking into one of these wells and he's looking at the water. Now this water here isn't particularly clever, clean looking water, but it's water. But that's all they have. That's all they'll get. That's the water source or one of the water sources. How do they do it? This is where your money goes. I love this. This is a good Kiwi solution to a problem. We have to get water, we have to put it in a bowser, we have to move it, we have to distribute it, we have to filter it, we have to clean it. What do you do? You get yourself a big ugly tractor with a big bowser on the back and away you go. Simple solution, this is practical stuff and this is what we do. It's a well-known fact that if you can give people clean water, you'll spend eight times less on health issues. So we give them clean water whenever possible. The water in the camps is a lifesaver. It's then got to be distributed, as is the other stuff that we have. Now, you can look at these photos and you think, well, that's not that many people to deal with. That's not really a big issue. But when you start putting it into proportion of how you're going to distribute this stuff, when I said, you know, that we're at risk, you imagine if this lot wanted to take over what you had stored in a tent behind you, it would happen. You are at risk. So you end up with developing techniques of sitting a group of people down 
and then when they're all sit down and calm down and all the rest of it, you can then go on and, and do your distribution in some sort of orderly fashion. Okay? So here's the situation. And then he had this photo here. Now this is the photo that, that got me going because I looked at it and I, I couldn't see any food being distributed. I could see a white hand. I could see all sorts of stories in a photo like that. You know, we've got dark hands, we've got light hands, we've got people wanting stuff. And here's this desperate people relying on other people. They have no choice as to what happens in their future. They aren't in control of their future. And I looked at that picture and you get I, that Bible verse, you know, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If ever a group felt forsaken, it had to be this lot. And I started thinking about that verse in the Bible and I, and I sort of, I've heard a couple of explanations as to why did Christ say that? Why did he say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I've heard different things. I've heard, you know, I read in, in uh, Corinthians where he became sin for us and God turned his back on him. And it doesn't actually say that God turned his back on him, but it says that he became sin for us. And I find that God turning his back on, we read in Romans, God will never forsake us. I, w I would never forsake my neighbor who I hardly know. We wouldn't do that to people. You know, we're not that sort of people. How can we understand why that God would forsake his son on the cross? And I've heard it explained that, well, he's quoting Psalm 22. Because in Psalm 22, it starts with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I, understand, and I, and I accept that. I can accept that when Christ is on the cross, he's quoting from Psalm 22. But, you know, I have trouble working out how do, I, how do I positively connect? How can I say to somebody, look, what he's saying is Psalm 22. You get these question marks. Well, how do I know that? How do I understand that? And it's actually really difficult to understand. So I started to sort of read a little bit about Psalms. And, and it's because we, we can't understand it because we don't actually, in a lot of cases, understand how Psalms work. So we don't understand that to the, to the Jews, the... Psalms were this mystical language. It was like the kids with the children's story here. They were anticipating the next word from the sound, you know, um, the rhyme, the rhythm. Psalms were sung. Psalms were memorized. They weren't numbered. They understood them for their meanings more than the words that were used. And in the Bible study this morning here, and in, in the, we mentioned Psalm 51, and I sat there and I thought, well, this is interesting because I'm going to start, I'm going to ask you to turn to your Bibles to Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is quite a, um, uh, it's typical of a lot of uh, Psalms. Not so much in the words that, you, that are used, but it's got a, a hidden structure, and it has hidden meanings, and it has... The, the mystical elements that I was talking about. And when you look at it, they're not immediately clear. They don't immediately jump out of the page at you and say, look, this is what the psalmist is intending. This is how it's written. This is how it should be read. Now, if we looked at it, we're going to break that psalm down and we're going to find out what's slightly different about this or unusual. And if we break the, the, um, the verses down, you'll actually find that the verses say two things. Each verse says the same thing twice. So if you look at verse 2 where it says, wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, cleanse me from my sin. It's saying the same thing twice. Every verse does that. So if you look at, I acknowledge my transgressions, my sin is ever before me. The whole way through that psalm, it does the same thing. Now that's what they call a chiastic psalm. And they get that if you look at verse 1, it's actually in it says the same thing twice, but it says it four ways. So if we connect the one, two, three, four sections of it, if we connect one and four and two and three, we get an X. The Greek letter X is chi. So it's a chiastic structure. And it, go, it does that for emphasis. It goes from left to right, left to right, and things like that. So, um, yeah, you can see the red and the black up there. So if we looked at Psalm 30, for instance, if someone said to me, where does Psalm 30 start, or where does it finish? I honestly would have to say 
it doesn't have a start and it doesn't have an end, which is really weird. But if you looked at Psalm 30, and if you looked at the first verse, it says the same as the last verse. And the second verse says the same as the second to last verse. In other words, it's building backwards up to a point. Psalm 30 is telling a story in a series of steps. So there's the last verses. They say the same as the first verses in a symmetrically opposite way. So you end up with Psalm 30 telling the story in steps, and it comes to a peak. And that's also a chiastic structure. So that, there's a lot of Psalms that do that. So you end up with, like we do it in English as well. If I said like this anticipation thing with the kids, you know how when you're teaching your kids the time, you, you could say the next line. If I said hickory dickory dock, mouse ran up the clock, the clock struck one, mouse ran down, hickory dickory dock. We're back to the beginning again. So we're teaching our kids to tell the time. There we've got this um, chiastic nursery rhyme, right? So we've come to this, we're at the start point, we've stepped up, we've made the point, and we come back down again. But the point is, the point of Psalm 30 is in the middle. So quite often a lot of these chiastic psalms, the point of the psalm, the whole reason for that psalm being written is to make a point, to make a statement, to, to deliver a message. Okay? So that's chiastic structure. If I wrote that on the wall and said, okay, that I've written this poetry, whatever these lines, it wouldn't make a lot of sense. Well, it would make a lot of sense, but it makes more sense when you see if we highlight just the first letters of that, those three lines, okay? Now, that there is called acrostics. It's something that maybe you did it at school or whatever. You can, you can end up making acrostic things out of you know, your name, and you can do, do that sort of stuff like Evan. It could be Eats, Various apples and nuts or something like that. You know, it's just like a, a, a sort of a different way of writing things, stuff like that. So if I looked at a poem and we started to read this, and this is from Lewis Carroll from uh, Through the Looking Glass, and it's an, a nice bit of poetry, but I've highlighted the first letter of each line. And you can't, I couldn't get it all onto one slide, but if we go right through the end of it, you'll find that the final chapter in Through the Looking Glass, Lewis Carroll has written this poem, and it spells out the name of Alice Pleasance Liddell, who was the original Alice in Wonderland, because he was writing to this little girl, and he wrote this story, and he put her name in it to be known in history now through this book, through this poem. How much more clever, like if we just looked at the first bit, it's lovely words, and it's a nice poem, and all the rest of it, but it becomes a lot more, you can understand that the guy who wrote it has this, he must have, must have wondered for hours. Because I couldn't do this. So here's this gifted writer who has, has done this. Now, if we looked at the Hebrew alphabet, which has 22 letters, and I'm going to go to the most well-known acrostic psalm, and it's Psalm 119. And if you look at 119 in your Bible, and especially in the, the older versions, some of the, the newer versions don't have these in it, but it starts off and it's got the word Aleph. So the first eight lines in the original Hebrew started with the letter, we're going to call it A, because if you go back to the alphabet, you'll see Aleph, Bet, Gimel, and it, that's the alphabet. Okay, just like we get our word alphabet from the two, the Greek words, you know, Alpha and Beta, you can almost see how the, the root of a lot of these words are all the same. So here we've got Psalm 119, the longest acrostic psalm, and it's got a stanza of eight. The first eight all start with the letter, we'll call it A. They all start with A. They all start with Aleph. The second stanza all starts with Beth, and so on, right the way through the psalm. So here's this clever writing, eight stanzas, 22 times, all starting with the first letter. What's that starting to tell us about that psalm? If you didn't know that, it now puts a whole new complexion on the complicity of that psalm. Isn't that clever? Wow, good on your brother, that's right. But it gets better than that with that psalm. If we take verse 1 and 9, so if we take the first of the A's, 
and the first of the Bs and the first of the Cs, you actually end up with 22 acrostic psalms using every letter of their alphabet. They all make sense. They stand alone individually. So you've got these 22 psalms overlaid on top of each other to end up with Psalm 119. Now, how's that for a while? You know, I mean, that, that, uh, I think that is inspiration. It has to be inspiration. That is just absolutely fantastic. Where to understand, we just read it as Psalm 119, and it's got nice words and all the rest of it. But to understand, we don't get that in English. We don't get a lot of the Psalms in English. Beautiful verses, we get the, we get the meaning, but we don't get the background. We don't get every bit of it. There are things that we do in English that do give us a picture. If, if you said you were going away on holiday and I said, what are you going to do about Felix and Fido? What am I saying? What am I asking him to consider? The cat and the dog, right? So by saying Felix and Fido, we get this mental picture. We can understand what I'm saying. But I haven't used the English words, have I? So I'm using a couple of Latin words. The Latin for cat is catus, and the Latin for dog is canis. We get the word canine, and we get the word cat. So I'm using a foreign language that aren't the words for cat and dog, but you understand immediately I said it, Felix and Fido, you know cat and dog. So here we've got Fido is faithful. We get the word fidelity. Felix happy and all that sort of stuff. So I'm using the attributes of the animal in a language that isn't really ours, but we understand what I'm saying. So by saying just those few things, we're immediately conjuring up this picture. Just as I would, um, you know, if, if I walked past somebody's car and it's leaking oil and I just said, a stitch in time, mate, and walked off, the whole expression is a stitch in time saves nine. I'm delivering a speech to this person and I'm saying, well, I could do it another way. I could walk up to him and say, look, mate, I notice your car's leaking oil and that oil's going to get into the waterways, it's going to kill the fish, and blah, 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 and I think that you should strip your car apart and fix this. And by the time I got even beginning that, he would have driven off and left me alone. But if I just said a stitch in time and walked away, he would know that I've recognised he has a problem with his car. I've delivered a speech on what, he should, what, I, what I think he should do about it, and he has the choice to either do it or not. But just in a few words, I've delivered the whole message, okay? And we do that a lot, you know, if somebody's kid's running a riot in their house, you know, maybe you wouldn't want to do this, but you might say, you know, spare the rod and all that sort of stuff. Um, and we all know what that means, you know, many hands. We've got lots of those things. If I was living in the centre of London and I said I had to get back to my trouble and strife, that means I've got to get back to my wife because of the rhyming slang. Here we've got those rhymes again. So here we've got the situations where by saying things, we immediately come up with this picture. And it's easy to do. And I've just given a few examples. Now, there are other things that we can say or that we can hear that can actually force us to, to take an action, to, to perform an action without even thinking of it. Just like we came up with the thing about what I'm going to do about my car, you can also say something that can make people do things they're not in control. Now, an example. A long time ago, when we were, Barbara and I were a lot younger, we never had any money. We still don't have any money, and we've got five kids, and we never had any money, but we, we came up with these ways of living. You know, it was, we would always shop at this one particular West Auckland supermarket. It was open late on a Thursday. We weren't attending church, but the manager had manager's specials, and he used to know that we had all these kids, you know, and, and he'd come up to me and he'd say, uh, manager's specials in five minutes. Well, that meant get yourself near the, the bread section because they'd come out and they'd mark loaves of bread down to five cents and stuff like that. And we used to fill her up, you know. And we used to get these bargains. He knew our situation. We understood what he was telling us and we did it. Anyway, I can remember walking into the store one day and had these big glass windows and you, start, you parked your car and you walked past the, the stall. You could see all the checkouts and everything to the door was down there. We were walking there, there one night and I was a lot... I was pretty scruffy. I had the long hair and the whiskers and boots. My, my uniform in those days was boots, footy shorts, T-shirt or maybe a singlet, and that was it. And 
we're walking along and a woman at the door, she shouted out, she called out, she said, stop that man. Well, immediately, without thinking, I hadn't long given up playing rugby. I'm only short, I was a lot trimmer than I was, but I knew how to look after myself. And I can remember instantly just stepping back a bit, boof, and I caught this chap under the chin. Without thinking, there was no thought involved. It was just, you knew what you had to do. Love thy neighbor and turn the other cheek. Did not, did not apply to getaway robbers and stuff like that. And I can remember, as he was parallel to the ground, about half a meter from the ground, I knew he was unconscious. And I knew he was not going to stand up, so I didn't have to do anything. I just stood there. I thought this was, was a really good hit. I mean, we used to call them a coat hanger or a, a car law handshake or something like that. You get banned for life for it. Now, anyway, boomfer, down he goes. But what I didn't realize, that it also had the same effect on women, but there must be a nanosecond delay because he went down on the ground and my wife immediately, it was like, ooh, she made sure he wasn't going to get up. Whatever breath was left in his body was gone. He was on the ground. And I'm standing there going, ooh, that's pretty cool. What a team, you know? And I remember sort of, looking up at this woman in the doorway, and she's still got her hand in the air, and she said, he's forgotten his change. <laughs> so it was pretty embarrassing. Ever have those ouch moments? Well, he had the big ouch moment, but, you know, we never went shopping that night, and I don't think we ever got the manager's specials again. But, and I don't remember how old he was or whether he actually had to put his false teeth back in or his glasses on. But it was very embarrassing, but it was instant. You heard, you did, you knew what action to take. Better get back to Psalm 22. So here we've got Christ on the cross quoting the beginning of Psalm 22. Now, to us, we look at it as a messianic psalm, okay? To the Jews of the day, not a messianic psalm a troubling psalm. The stuff that happened in Psalm 22 never happened to King David, right? The end of Psalm 22, the last verse, they will proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn. He has done this. Now, if you look at John 19, what does he say? The last thing he says, he says, it is finished. Now, it is finished in the desire of ages, Alan White says that it is finished. It does have a deep significance. It means it's, it's, it's not over as in I give up, we've lost. It's what I set out to do is finished. Which is the same as the last verse in Psalm 22. So we've got Christ saying the first verse, and he's saying the last part of Psalm 22. What do we know now knowing what we know about Psalms? and chiastic structures, they should have been looking for something, <coughs> a pointer. Now, is there a chiastic pointer in Psalm 22? And it is. It's there to the Jews that understood it. It's there in big blazing lights. There is a chiastic structure to which they should have been pointed. It starts in verse 12. Now, the chiastic structure here is in the animals mentioned. It doesn't have to be words that are the same. It can be in ideas that are the same. If anybody wants to study this, look at chiastic structures, Google it or whatever you have to do. It's an absolutely fascinating story because the same structures are evident in Revelation, in, in the story of Noah, it's in the prodigal son, it's in, it's in everywhere, and it's as a powerful tool. So here we've got, starting at verse 12, We've got the structures of the bulls, the lion, the dogs. Then it starts back again. We're hickory dickory docking backwards, right? And we're going from the dogs to the lion to the oxen. So we've come to that point. And what's the point? The point is around 16, verse 16, 17, 18. For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and they stare at me. They divide my garments among them. For my clothing they cast lots. What if Christ's supporters had said, or what if Christ had said, I'm the Messiah, because it was prophesied that the Messiah will ride through Jerusalem on a donkey. So I've got to be the Messiah. It wouldn't have washed, would it? Because that could have been something engineered. 
But here, right in the middle, in the midst of a group of people that memorize, sing, know these psalms inside out, immediately this st structure has been pointed out to them. So what should they have understood? They should have understood. In fact, I'm sure they did understand that they had killed the Messiah. They should have seen the predictions coming true there and then because they understood it. They, understood, they understand Psalms better than anyone else. It's their writings. And they do understand it. So here's the structure. Immediately what should have come up was, um, yeah, we've, if they didn't understand that they killed the Messiah, then they must have realized something's going wrong when they go back to the synagogue and the curtains rip from top to bottom. So here you've got this thing, what should they have done? What should they have done? What did they do? You know, they entombed him and put this big rock across the front. And here we are, you know, we've got to be careful because we understand the Bible. We read the Bible, we study the Bible. But do we really know, you know, what do we do? Because what happens next is what's important to us. You know, we have to, we have to, we have to learn, you know, we, we do our Bible study, we do our Sabbath schools and stuff like that, and we learn all this stuff, but we've got to put it into practice. We really have to be exceptionally careful about what we do. And it's those sort of things, you know, that, um, you know, I come back to the address side of it, you know. I really wish, in a lot of cases, that I didn't know that there's suffering going on because then I wouldn't worry about that. I have to actually do something about it. You know, it's like here we're talking about in our lessons uh, this last week, you know, about we have, we have faith, we have the law. You know, the law is, is if we don't know the law, we, we don't sin. But we do understand what's going on out there, and we do have a responsibility to take an action about it. So I'm going to leave it at, um, you know, I just thought that's a really, it's sort of a, a connection between now I know why Christ would say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was part of a whole lesson to everybody. It was part of the whole thing. And to understand that, we do need to study our Bibles. We do, we do need to study the structure and the way that a lot of it's written. And that's just a little tiny scratch on the surface. And if anyone is interested in that, study further, because it is fantastically interesting how it all works. So I'm going to um, finish by just sort of saying, hey, um, please consider these. I would love to distribute our information to you all. would love to talk about it. I can talk about things that Adra are doing. I'll do it all day if I have to. But it's one of those things where if you've got um, ideas where how we can take what we learn in church and put it into the community, we can help. We would love to help. We'd love to see this church as being active outside of this building, outside in our community is where we need to operate. And I think we have, do we have a final hymn? Yes, we do have a final hymn. Um, the final hymn that we're going to sing is what I would consider a real Adra hymn. Now, it's number 363. If you look at the words... Take particular notice of the words. It's actually got a beautiful tune as well, but we don't really know it. So what we're going to do is we're going to put it to a tune that we do know, which was uh, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. It's a simple tune that everybody knows, but think about the words, because if ever there was an Adra hymn, it's this one. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for this church that we can worship in. We thank you for the safety and security that we have in this country. We pray, Lord, that um, you'll present situations for us to share our, share our faith with others. We pray for situations where we can show that we're a church of compassion as well as a church of people of the, of the uh, Holy Word. We ask, Lord, that uh, you keep us safe Bring us safely back here or to another church next week. Lord, we ask that um, you'll continue to bless us. Help us to, to promote 
to promote you as our God. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.